Welcome to Still Entitled, the Adam Savage Project. I'm Will. I'm Adam. And I'm Norm. Hello, gentlemen. Hello, hello gentlemen. Hello, hello. Norm, Will, you were wearing I... the same t-shirt last week. Oh, shoot. <laughs> it's it's my Tuesday t-shirt. It, routines are important. <laughs> routines are really important wow. these days. That's why I'm finding. I appreciate that. And, and it's not that. even like it's it's allocated as that day. I think it's just my brain is... That's what goes through the, the wash and dry cycle and yeah, that's what, a certain part of the stack. Yeah. You, you alphabetize them going in the closet, so you take them out in a specific order. This is the C day. <laughs> it's a good t-shirt. What are you guys doing? Yeah, doing great. I'm all right. Guys? I'm yeah. all right. I, so I had to uh, – I have uh, – I got a piece of metal in my eye. Jesus. Yeah. Um, How would you do that? Well, I was machining some steel. Uh, and that would seem to be all re- all the explanation that would be yeah, necessary. Yeah, I got it. I'm, what kind of safety protection gear were you wearing, Adam? I had these on, and I had a shield in front of what oh, I wow. was machining. The problem was is that I turned away, and a piece came over my shield and hit me in the eye. Oh, shit. Are and you okay? I, yeah, I'm okay. Um, okay. I, I thought that I'd gotten it out, but the next morning, the irritation was such that it was clear that I hadn't. So even though I have, you know, even though I pay 40 grand a year for my health insurance and that's just the silver plan, um, I can't get an appointment with my GP in less than like 10 days, right? Like that's just what it takes. So I also have a membership with one medical, which is like the accelerated, the extra add on that accelerates. And one medical got me in within an hour. And then referred me to an ophthalmologist within two hours. Wow. And three hours after I woke up, I had a bandaged contact lens, which was so sorry. So they numbed the eye. They took out what they could, but there was still a little speck that was a couple of layers down in the cornea. Oh, and the when cornea. that happens, yeah. And when that happens, they, the body naturally moves that stuff out towards the surface, but it takes time. So they took out what they could, gave me a blank contact to sort of protect it. And then told me to come back in a week. And that contact fell out yesterday, last night. So I emailed them this morning at like 9 a.m. And I was at the ophthalmologist at 9.45. They, could, they, they called me right away and they fit me in. And I saw Dr. Wang, my opt- the ophthalmologist, like right away. I was totally blown away. Mm. That's awesome. I know. It felt like... It felt like it felt like what the doctor going to the doctor is like in a romantic comedy. That's so, what it felt like. It's Jump funny. Cut. My my ophthalmologist, the, I <laughs> needed emergency appointments a couple of times, and it's usually for something like an eye infection or or like a one time I tore a contact taking it out, and it, like half of it got stuck and rolled back in, and they were like, "Yeah, just come on in," and and it was. Like the difference, whereas when you call to get an appointment, it's like, hey, yeah, come by in three months. Uh, yeah. it, it's nice that they have those emergency appointments. I'm glad that your eye work is okay. What, was this the really first scary. time you've had something like this happen to your eye? I've never had What Walk us through what that's like. Like you hear, do you feel it? Like what's uh, the, when it, <laughs> as it happened? Okay. So I've gotten a lot of stuff in my eyes over the years. I have had, I have, and for all the people who are going to tweet at me, like, wear eye protection and I do for the heavy stuff and I don't enough. That being said, I have gone to the doctor twice in 40 years of making stuff. Yeah. Um, And the first time was a piece of, (laughs) the first time was really nasty. It was at ILM and I was using a table saw and acrylic and an acrylic spike went into my (sighs) eye. And when I went to the doctor later that day and they numb it, Right with this stuff that just feels like heaven, he's like, "This is a big spike. It's bigger than we usually see." Listen, you can hear it, and he clicked his little. Yeah, you can. Not okay, man. <laughs> that is not okay. Um, what the hell? The thing is, is I've also gotten steel. I've also gotten, and it's been this has been twenty years, but I heard about this from an old machinist. And then I had a chance to use it, which is if you get a little bit of steel grinding dust in your eye and you can see it, Uh, you you look in the mirror, you can see it, you can get it out using a magnet. Oh my God. I've actually done that where you clean the magnet and I 
put it in your rubber glove finger and bring it really close and you watch the little speck go to the magnet it's it's like science fiction uh, it's I, like I'm at okay that point with- i know you have like the number one priority get shit out of i be safe so you're not thinking about the content creation but that's a perfect opportunity for a a slow motion macro camera. Yeah, it's like the ultimate popping video right there. Unbelievable. I don't know um, if I have the wherewithal to do it. Look, I also have a full complement of saline here at the shop and eye wash cups and all that yeah. stuff. And I did all that right afterwards to try and get it. And I, and I just didn't. And Julia took a close look. She couldn't see anything. But the eye, you know, it requires a slit, one of those little slit scanners to see up close. Yeah. Wow, that's intense. I am... Um... Uh, yeah, no, I, that's always my fear is like, I don't, I'm okay with like bodily injury, but eyeball wounds are just, ugh. yeah. Well, that's why you read one of those, the people who have the contact lenses stuck or tear I've had, I've had that go happen. behind the eyeball that freaks me out. So you know, I had that happen. Is, is that, does it go all the way? Like I've had a contact lens get lost so, and I was able to go get it. There's a thing the the, the way you, the way, you, the way they had me fix it was, they moisturized the hell out of my eye and then they were like, okay, they laid me back flat on my back and they were like, look as high up as you can yeah. and look left and right. And then it like caught on the front part of my eye uh-huh. and rolled back down. Um, but yeah, that was, that was not a great day. Like I, <laughs> I, it happened because I put, I was, I was tired or something and I put both contacts in one eye. Oh. I don't know if you've ever done that before, but like I put it in the right eye and then I put it in the right eye because it was new contact day. And uh, it wasn't good. It was not. A, it was not a great day. Yeah. Yeah. Side I, eye um, protection. That's that's the tough. Part. Yeah, you got side eye. Side eye is a, is a is very dangerous. You got to protect against that. So it's totally true. And uh, the fact is, is that uh, I I I have face shields, but somehow my my I and I ordered them on Amazon this morning. My I, my goggles, and I really love the um. My favorite goggles are the Dewalt's. Hmm. Um, because they fit around my glasses, but they actually provide a soft, complete oh. covering around my eye sockets. I really dig that. Um, in fact, the ophthalmologist this morning, Dr. Wang, was saying that she wants to promote protesters wearing goggles at the protests. And the mask wearing has been very ex- extensive and terrific. Yeah. Um, but she also points out that if you really want to be safe, you should be wearing the goggles. A, as well. a literal pair of five dollar goggles. There's a couple of reporters that got hit in the face. One of one in Minneapolis who is looks like she's going to lose her eye and has a mortgage worth of medical bills to pay. Uh-huh. And like a pair of five dollar goggles would have protected her in yeah. that situation, which yeah. it doesn't help now. But yeah, we were doing um, a shoot with a, a blacksmith um, a couple months ago before the lockdown, which stuff yeah. will come out after lockdown. And one of the guys there was wearing these which Ooh. apparently are very popular if you're uh they are they are goggles that look like my glasses but they have wow. oh the wow side the side shields the side shields. Well, you, yeah. you can also get clip-on side shields too i i they never, they're not particularly comfortable but also getting a piece of metal in your eye probably isn't very comfortable too i guess it's what the shop teacher in me would say <laughs> um i i my uh adam if it helps i had a friend who used to tell a story about his high school shop teacher who didn't wear glasses this was in the 80s before lawyers were a thing apparently and he said that the shop teacher said look if everybody wore safety glasses all the time you wouldn't have contact lenses in your eyes right now because we would have never known that you can have plastic in your eyes with no irritation had it not been for the you know the pilots who got canopy shards embedded in their eyeballs in world war ii so oh. you know you're doing science over there uh, uh 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 neil stevenson told me this mind-blowing story when i was doing work on the mythbusters whip episode uh, capturing the speed of a whip at its yeah. tip and neil had done a huge amount of of course neil level deep research on whips as part of uh seven eats Oh, okay. Right, because that's right. one of yes, the ways yes, in which yes. they, yeah. yeah. Like all that, uh, yes, it's a big plot point. He did all that research of how you'd grab on fling and yeah. 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 So it turns out there's this fascinating story about do whips break the speed of sound? And it is, it comes from World War One, where post-World War One, there were no trucks in Europe. Every truck had been used for the war effort and everything was destroyed, and delivery still needed to happen. So for the first time in a couple of decades, people saddled up their horses and started using them for deliveries again. 
This is immediately post World War I. But the problem they had is they lost a lot of institutional knowledge during the 20 years everyone was driving. Mm -hmm. And they didn't know how to saddle up, horse teams, et cetera, but they also didn't know there weren't enough whips. There weren't enough whips to keep the horses going. And they discovered that grounding straps from factories, the braided copper grounding straps, made terrific whips. Oh my they, God. They, were, they were terrific at transferring the energy wave until it made a cracking sound. So horse teams were, being, were using these grounding straps. And it led to an eye doctor who saw two different people with the same condition that he couldn't understand, which was they had, they had degeneration of their eyesight. And when he looked at their eyes under a microscope, he could see that there were these little tubes of metal in their eye. And copper is apparently really, really toxic to, your, to uh, the flesh of your eye. Of your cornea? Wow. Yeah. And it turned out this doctor was able to figure out that the whip grounding straps were not only breaking the speed of sound, but that the breaking of the speed of sound at the tip exceeded the structural integrity of the copper wire and caused little tiny shards of copper to embed wow. in the eye of the operator. Wow. Right. I mean, it's a completely amazing story. And Neil, I mean, the, the best thing is, is that when he says like, I got a story about that. You should call me. And you call him and you get like this hour long soliloquy that starts with like an eye doctor in Vienna and ends with horse drawn carriages and trucks after world war one. The, the, the idea of institutional knowledge getting like important institutional knowledge getting lost is, is a really like it's, we talked about paper towels last week, but as we've gone back to using dish rags for almost everything, like the, the things that you don't know, because I've never ever used dish rags in, in a house. Like the, I, I'm sure that happens constantly, the, like the, the, the loss of institutional knowledge. Well, and it's the, the loss is one thing, but the other thing that gets lost is a respect for that institutional knowledge. Yeah. Right? Like, and it's not just a, it, it, basically you end up thinking. So uh, uh, there's a story that I heard, and I talked about this uh, in Peter Jackson's airplane factory. They have... Uh, aluminum body fuel pumps that are brazed to steel outlet pipes. And this is not something that we know how to do. Yeah. Right. And consequently, it took them a couple of years to find the, the original process, which involves galling up a end, uh, a, 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 a die Look grinder at. bit with aluminum, taking a steel die grinder bit and galling it up with aluminum, and then rubbing that aluminum on a steel pipe makes the steel and aluminum both able to be grabbed by the same soldering wow. compound, by wow. the same brazing compound, right. And it's like, so we think, we, we tend to think what, as we progress that whatever we progress to is much better than the other thing. And it's not better, it's just different. Well, the end result may be better, but the process is completely different. Is the is the is the point, right? This is so. This is really germane that you bring this up, Will, about that institutional knowledge, because right now I'm in the process of of re. I've I've fallen back in love with the Aces helmet, uh, the orange shuttle yeah. suit, and the whole suit and the helmet. And it's never one I thought was amazing until I replicated it, and then I fell totally in love with it. It it looks really good when you're wearing it. Like it it looks it it looks like a spacesuit. And it's the orange safety vest of the space program, right? I mean, it is the workhorse, the basic, it's the, it's the, it is the, the most ubiquitous of all of the space suits. Probably more hours spent in those than any other space suit in, Indeed. in, except for maybe the, the Soviet stuff. And I was on the RPF and somebody was working on making themselves a helmet and I posted the draw, I made a drawing of all the parts in the ear of the ACES helmet. And there's like 28 parts in the ear. And I yeah. had to figure out every single one by staring at those drawings for hours and weeks. And I, I made a drawing of it and I posted it. And the guy was like, holy cow, I am sure this is the only source of this information on the internet. And I realized, no, he's totally right. No, it's nobody else's except the makers of the helmet at David Clark Company understand this structure. And I don't even understand it uh, uh, mechanically. I just understand right. yeah, you, it visually. Yeah. So I started to collate what I learned from the orange suit. And I'm, I'm, I, I may end up 
making a series of drawings of this. This is something that I'm considering right now of like taking all that institutional knowledge I built and putting it somewhere because Mary Robinette Cowell was doing some research about uh, Snoopy caps and the guy, the, the, the archivist at NASA said to her, well, if you really want this straight dope, you should call Ryan Nagata. <laughs> and this is the best thing, right? Like, yeah weird side projects from makers can sometimes yield whole like icebergs of the, of institutional knowledge that gets lost unless you call unless you codify it somewhere. So that's why I'm thinking about doing this. Obsession, that, it turns out leads to knowledge. Yes. To yes. Is that something you plan uh, on kind of rebuilding like you do, you're going to do for the A7L? Um, like, I, I have a, uh, so I've made my hero helmet. Like I have the Aces helmet. <clears throat> I made three of them and two of them are spot on. And the third one is freaking perfect. It's and that third one's my personal. Intricate, one. right? Like the, with the bar and the, the yep, tape yep. application. And, and, and the, yeah. the Baylor bar latch actually works. Uh, Chris Gilman at Global Effects sent me one that worked. Um, but the orange suit, I've actually, my seamstress, Maggie Heeman, has actually been working for months on one more orange suit for me that's actually made out of the correct orange Nomex. Ooh, oh, wow. And wow. that just that just like satisfies me. So I will go into that one and make functioning wrist rings and a functioning neck, well, functioning, function. Uh, make a, an aluminum neck ring and make all the parts as, as, as high fidelity as I possibly can. And again, even a careful viewer might not be able to tell the difference between the other two suits and this one. But yeah, I am making one perfect that's awesome. Are you going to, are you, I assume, I mean, I know lots of those go out for trade and stuff, but are you going to do one that's like a weathered? I mean, I guess, I guess those suits never really got dirty because they go from like the, the dressing room to the, up the elevator into the clean room into yeah. the cockpit. You, can, you, yeah. can, you can't really notice any actual weathering. Uh, on the Snoopy caps, you can because there's a lot of training they did in white and black Snoopy caps, and those tended to get really worn out. Yeah. You can see it, especially because it's like it's human sweat and all that. Yeah. Um, but uh, no, for the most part, there's not a lot of weathering on those things. Huh. Interesting. Um, total tangent. In the last two nights, and I know I did this at the very beginning of the lockdown, I again watched Alien and Aliens. <laughs> uh, but this time with my mom, who hadn't seen either since oh. they had come out. Oh, wow. And I'm here to tell you, aliens scared the bejesus out of my mom. She loved it. She just had the best Wait, time. aliens, yes? Both of them. Both of them. Got yeah. it, got it. They're both, uh, they came up in a, I'm, I'm, I'm watching, CNN did like a eight-part documentary series on the history of film. One episode, like two hours for each decade of film, which still yeah. feels like, it's like a visual Wikipedia page, right? It's yeah. satisfying the same way in that, you know, the interviews, they have all the directors talk about their, their, their favorite films. They show the great clips. You're, it's like I could spend two hours watching a great film, which I would love to do. But sometimes you're in, this mo in, in the mood to watch a documentary, hearing people talk about film. Yeah. And, and then they had both Ridley Scott. Uh, well, James Cameron wasn't in this one, but Ridley Scott talk about aliens and uh, passing the torch on uh, Jim Cameron for making huh. that. It's a stunning sequel. And it's so good. And... They're both such, um, they're both so wonderfully scary and neither of them lets up. I mean, there, there's, the, there's the quiet bit in the middle of Aliens that you need, like, like the thing that's amazing about Aliens is when they land on the planet and you expect the monsters to come out and start, start attacking them immediately. And then you have like a 20 minute sequence where they don't, there's no monsters, right? Like it's, right. it's yeah. in the middle of what should be the scariest part of the movie, they just let it breathe. And it's and it's such a it's such an unusual it's 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 interesting because I mean obviously both that the sequel isn't really the same genre of movie as the as oh totally Alien different is. genres yeah and and James Cameron did that with Terminator as well because like Terminator Two is uh, I think a very different kind of movie than than Terminator One I mean they both you know killer robot from space whatever um, but but it's it's something we don't do very much anymore is make a sequel that dramatically uh, usurps your expectation. It's not like Guardians of the Galaxy Two was a was a you know heartfelt period piece where you know you got to go to I, Ragnarok. I, going back to Thor. I mean Ragnarok that's, is it? Yeah, I guess so, it's that's why it was so refreshing. New director, yeah. Yeah. new direction leading into what people love, and not being afraid to 
to have it be completely different tone because I mean, and, and, and maybe that's the maybe that's the thing is that like when you have a really confident director, they're like, mm, I think that this totally weird direction is super valid and I'm just going to run all the way towards it. Yeah. yeah. We're going to make it's, half I, Gladiator, half Tommy Boy. I think that's why people are so <laughs> resistant to remakes because so often in, in a remake, uh, a director wants to uh, try to recreate the feelings that they had when they saw the original and, in, and through their lens. Um, but the characters are, are, so, are so versatile. I mean, if you think about superheroes, right? Captain America also, between one and two, he went from war movie, adventure film, Joe yeah. Johnson, to, to Russo Brothers, Spy, spy Movie. Yeah. Spy yeah. Well, I mean, and it's, it's why I am always a supporter of, why remake great movies? Don't remake great movies. Don't remake Point Break. Don't waste our time. Remake bad movies. Yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah, and re- I, like, I know that there's a lot of love for the original Sabrina the Teenage Witch, but the reboot with Kiernan Shipka is so brilliant to go super dark with that, with that, with that idea and just take it in a completely different direction. That's, well, you also think of Buffy. Yeah. Buffy was right, the yeah. first totally. one who did that as, as a remake, but completely different uh, with a very specific vision that, that Whedon had. You mentioned Alien and Aliens, and I think that is one of the topics that gets argued over in terms of which one is better in uh, a series that you're participating in on on uh ah! on... wow that was an amazing segue that norm. was beautiful norm i'm blown away <laughs> it's a false dichotomy by the way to talk about which one is better but yes sci-fi channel premieres great debate on this thursday uh host baron vaughn uh and a bunch of friends of mine were actually on the show aisha tyler uh, it was so much fun to do this. This is a, this is a thing that we've been doing at Comic-Cons for years uh, with the Sci-Fi Channel. Um, folks like Orlando, jo- the amazing Orlando Jones, uh, John Barrowman, John Hodgman, Aisha Tyler, and I have all done these at New York and San Diego Comic-Con. They turned it into a show. It was the last job I did before the lockdown. I literally drove to LA instead of flying because I was no longer comfortable with flying that week. Wow. wow. And I mean, that's that, on this week? That is yeah, on Thursday, Thursday night. And it's awesome. a, it's basically the format that you said you do you used to do at Comic-Cons. Obviously Comic-Con is not happening in person this year. There will be an online version which we're very excited for. Uh, but the reason that that panel is so fun to watch because everyone in the audience feels like they have gone through those same arguments. They want you feel like you're engaged, you want to participate and nothing ever gets really resolved. Nothing it's gets all resolved. in the yeah. It's it, it's it's all in the exploration of the, the performative comments. conversation. Yeah. Performative yeah. conversation, exactly. And you know, I I one of the things that I love doing is both bringing all of the like the overwrought intellectualism I like to bring to film analysis in the middle of a rowdy bunch of comedians slagging off on movies is really fun and then i also don't ever mind taking the um the super contrarian position that a hot dog is a sandwich (laughs) i'm always happy to be the villain that gotham needs rather than the hero that they want (laughs) um that sounds awesome uh hey thanks to everybody a few weeks ago i asked about cad programs and a bunch of people recommended fusion 360 which i spent um I've watched a lot of YouTube videos over the last three weeks. And finally on Friday afternoon at like five o'clock, I had that moment where everything started clicking and all of a sudden all the stuff that I kind of understood but didn't really get just slotted into place. And I managed to get like, you know, like millimeter precise mounting holes and stuff like that for a bunch of electronics parts on the things that I'm working on. And uh, the advice that everybody gave on Twitter was hugely, hugely helpful. So thank you all. Nice. Yeah. Um, I have a recommendation uh, for a movie that's on Amazon. It's called The Vast of Night. The and Vast of Night. The Vast of Night. It's a great name. It's a hugely inspired by Twilight Zone, a story about a small town in New Mexico in, I believe, the 50s, and something weird's happening. Oh, right. It Area on... 51, somebody discovers something? K- kind of, yeah. I don't want to give too many spoilers, but it's a small, small town feel. Two central characters. One is a... Um, aspiring dj on the radio you know it's in the 50s in that era where yeah local radio was a big thing for people driving on the interstate and uh, they hear something over the signal um and it's small film beautifully shot there's great tracking shots and it 
it feels very true to the sensibilities of Twilight Zone, not only in the unraveling of the mystery, uh, but also the way that it's not really about the mystery. It's about the tensions of the time and the people. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, the vast of night. Um, I watched all of Space Force the other day. The, oh, how, the how Netflix Steve, Steve Carell, Carell thing. Yeah. Uh, Steve Carell is awesome. Uh, 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 Lisa Kudrow is hilarious. Uh, like, it, um, it's the show is real all over the like. It doesn't feel Greg Danielsy in the way that like King of the Hill or something like that. That is usually uh, the humor is like sometimes like the tone is all over the place. Like there's there's they're definitely it's constantly dragging on Trump. You know, the, so the setup is the president makes an executive order to create this new branch of the military and the guy who thinks he's going to be in charge of the air force is suddenly in charge of this and has to move to some podunk town in Colorado to, to, to be the leader of the people that get there. And, um, and uh, uh, John Malkovich is his unhinged in the most delightful possible way. Cause he plays like the rock. He plays like this, the, you know, Carell plays the military guy and Malkovich plays the, the science, you know, the scientist, the rocket scientist. Oh, I didn't realize Malkovich was in it. That's awesome. It's it cast. is like those interactions are fabulous. There's stuff around the edges. It's real weird. Like there's an AOC alike and there's a Nancy Pelosi alike and oh. they're horrible character caricatures. Like they're unfunny. Um, not, not, you know, right. Like it's, there's, it feels like it was, I, I don't, I don't know. It, it just feels like it needed a little more time maybe to like get tone consistent yeah. across, or they tried to four quadrant and make like, make it, you know, own the libs and the and the alt right people at the same time, and they just missed part of it. I I don't know, but Steve, it's it's nice to see Steve Carell being Steve Carell in in a in a it, it's a good format for him. I love uh, that guy. Yeah, he's always he seems, great. Yeah, really funny. Is the show? Did you like the show overall? And finishing the series, I like. I'm really conflicted in a way. Like usually, I don't make it through things that I'm not kind of into and yeah. i was literally sitting there doing like crossword puzzles on my phone on saturday night and and just like the episodes are short so it went fast um and and i kind of wanted to see it had the, it has a very very much has a i want to see what happens next but aside from Karel and malkovich and lisa kudrow who is inexplicably in prison um for like 40 years like i don't know like like I was looking for those specific performances and the rest of it, I could kind of take or leave. Oh, interesting. Yeah. What's on your docket to watch Adam? Uh, I think that tonight, again, another movie that my mom has not seen since it came out is Raiders of the Lost Ark. Wow. Oh, wow. You're just going back and to the, the, the warm and you're kind of a fan of that, huh? And, and to be honest, I watched Raiders all the way through maybe three weeks ago. Mm. as comfort food in the middle of one night and i don't mind jumping right back in man it is it is one of the most important films in my in in the in the in my mental canon so yeah we're gonna watch that tonight do you okay. do you i mean everybody has gaps in their in their film knowledge do you have big stuff that you like wish you'd watched at this point or you feel like you've got you've hit the high points oh god no 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 there's a whole bunch of cassavetes films i've never seen which i know i ought to um there's uh there's chunks of kurosawa's over i haven't yet seen um i haven't seen gone with the freaking wind um well he's <laughs> bad news adam <laughs> um yeah no everybody has gigantic dumb gaps in there you know a few years ago i decided to remedy one of my gaps and watch uh uh, uh casablanca which i had never seen oh wow and I ended up, I ended up, this is pre-streaming. So this is uh, uh, mid, early aughts. And I went and bought the DVD and I watched it. And I really liked it. And then I saw that Roger Ebert did the commentary. And oh, I wow. thought, that sounds really worth watching. So I watched it twice in a row, the second time with Roger Ebert's commentary. And what an what a amazing education in film. Yeah. It is to watch that movie and then immediately watch it again. Because first of all, it's completely watchable twice in a row without any oh, yeah. heavy breathing, right? It's and so good. And we'll talk about a relevant film today. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But, but, and, yeah. And, and Ebert really walks you through 
I mean, as he's such a lover of film. He's such a he, there's no there's no pretense about how much he loves it, and that just makes it really enjoyable to listen to his commentary about almost anything. Uh, Citizen Kane is the other one where he did an amazing, amazing I, commentary. It's so oh, really, good. really, yeah. I've never seen that. Yeah. Citizen Kane or the commentary? I've seen Citizen Kane dozens of times, never the okay. commentary. The, his comment it was on the 50th anniversary dvd i think and it was it it is it was exceptional it's really good i didn't know he did one for casablanca so a couple of times ago when we went to uh weta workshop norm i sat on the plane to new zealand next to john gata mm -hmm. uh effects director of the matrix films and a, a bazillion other things right just a, a god of academe of effects directing right <clears throat> and we knew we we we've known each other peripherally. I mean, I worked for him on the Matrix sequels, but like he didn't know me from Adam back then. Uh, but we are you know professionally friendly. But this is the first time we'd had the chance to really sit and talk, and so I got to ask him about my favorite DVD commentary, which is the commentary for the Matrix. I don't know if I've talked about it on the podcast. No. But, oh, the commentary for the Matrix is amazing because it is John. <laughs> It's the editor, and it's Carrie Ann Moss, and that's it. Yeah, they were like, who could we get? This is a thing we're doing now on DVD. <laughs> you know, what John tells me is he thinks that might have been the very first commentary. For, oh, for no. that type of release, for that type of home video yeah. uh, so, feature. So there's this point in the commentary, and it's unedited. So there's this point in the commentary when the, when the camera is zooming into Neo's mouth and then you see the Matrix and now you're in the Matrix, etc. The cameraman's like, this is uh, visually interesting. John, maybe you'd like to talk about this. And you hear John go, what? <laughs> like, <laughs> all, all of this annoyance is just right oh there. My God. And he said, yeah, we didn't get any guidance at all. They just put us in a room, they put the movie on and they recorded whatever we said. It wasn't... We didn't know that there should be a structure to how we spoke about it or what they wanted us That's to talk amazing. about or anything. The, the, the one, problem. the Affleck one for, I think, Armageddon is legendary because he, the number of fucks he gives is zero. Oh, really? So is it is that in a good way? Is he, like, funny? It's very entertaining. And I think they were probably really drunk. I think I that's, that. that's one of the secrets. I think when they do them or, you know, in the peak day of early blu-ray late dvd uh it was get them loosened up yeah. and, oh, wow. uh, and and then produce it and those are so much better the, the ones i don't like is when they have people they try to two structure and they be it's piecemeal people who almost like aren't even the same room together i, you, I hate it when they're not watching yeah. at the same time when they're just like dropping anecdotes in on top of the yeah. movie it's not you don't want pop-up videos you want yeah. you want you want to feel what the Russo brothers feel when they're like, oh, this show, we have to do it seven times, you know, and they're I, mad about it. I, I mean, I wish that some of those Marvel movies, actually, it's one of the things that they don't do on the Marvel movies very much is commentary tracks. And I, I, I feel like they've kind of faded off as we move towards streaming. And it's I a miss real loss. That. I really, yeah. really miss it. And it was occurring to me that we should do another unauthorized commentary simply yeah. because I want to put more commentaries out into the world. Uh, totally. It turns out now you can watch together on Plex and it will uh, sync up everybody's playing at the same time. So if it's something we have on Backlog, uh, we, it's, we've used that a lot. Prime, really. Prime. So there, there, there's, uh, Prime and Plex also. There, there's, a, there's an ILM, uh, a group of ILMers that's been getting together and having Zoom parties. And I joined in one weekend a couple of weeks ago. And I was thinking, you know, this would be fun maybe to bring in an, a, a, an effects guy, one of my old colleagues, as yeah. part of one of these unauthorized commentaries to add some real perspective. Yeah. Because it was like, I was in the model shop and we didn't talk a lot about the shows that we worked on. But when you hang out with the effects directors and art directors of those movies, that's all you end up talking about. There's all this really awesome extra stuff around who first drew that piece and when the director came up with this and how this bit got added in. It's really, like this really cool history. Well, and, and it's stuff like, um, I can't remember where I learned. So it might've been, it might've been on, um, it might've been on uh, uh, Blank Check, the podcast, uh, when they did the Phantom Menace episodes. But I, I didn't appreciate how much of that, like all those ships are practical. And I had, I, I assume when you see the shiny metal ones that they're all oh, CG man. and like, I wow. spent a whole, I spent I spent hours and hours and hours one weekend with 
heat guns and John Goodson and John Duncan and I and I think Brian Grenand um, using heat guns and uh, silver mylar to do all the covering on the Queen ship and attempting to make it each per panel being perfectly covered and each one took three or four tries. Wow. We're stretching and pulling and moving this giant carbon fiber buck that was the queen ship, but it was a beautiful model when we were done. Is there yeah, a was... specific movie in mind that you want to do a commentary for, you think, Adam? Uh, no, except that I was just thinking that, I mean, there, I was, I was thinking about how much institutional knowledge I've built about films that I love, like Alien and Aliens. Uh, yeah. That that it's something like that is worthwhile, right? Yeah. Like like yeah. you and Lee Unkrich talking about Shining, The Shining would be amazing. Um, Holy cow! That's totally that's a great one. That's a great yeah. one. It's I I you know we're both such fans, but we've never watched that movie together. No, oh my god! And I no, bet you both know things that the other person doesn't know. Oh well, like, yeah. Lee is. Lee is the, the literally. I, I know Lee is the, the high god bar, of yeah. academe of The Shining, right? He is the mm -hmm. he is the guy with all where where all the bodies are buried. Yeah, right. Cool. Uh, my 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 son thing too watched The Shining the other night uh, with First some time? friends who no he had seen it, but his friends hadn't. And the thing that I have you watched The Shining recently? It's been ten years, probably. Okay, the thing about The Shining is that in your head, I'll bet. The, that uh, I bet in your head you feel like The Shining is a little bit slow at the beginning, but then it picks up. And the answer is The Shining starts off at a gallop and never stops. So I read the book probably twice before I saw the movie. It starts with the movie starts with him driving with them driving up into the mountains, right? It has that long it's shot of the car thing. running yep. along. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And the, uh, and the and the and the interview with Mister Omen, the banal, the oh. like long banal right, 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 right. In, in the yeah. room that doesn't make sense where it is. Right, right. The room that shouldn't be. Yeah. <clears throat> but the yeah. thing is, is that The Shining gets weird and spooky within minutes. It, we, it doesn't waste any time take real, making you realize, like, this is not going to be... This I is don't, do you notice that on the first viewing, though? I feel like it would just be unsettling. I, I, I need to go back no, and you don't this. notice. It's been a long it. time. The, th the thing is, is that uh, everyone I know who's seen it recently, I bring this up and they all agree, is that when you remember the film, you remember this like, oh, well, there was a period of time when they got there that it was kind of okay and then it got bad. And the answer is no, it starts off bad and yeah. just gets worse. Interesting. I guess well, it's happen. been a long time. Yeah. Let's figure this out. That would be awesome. Yeah. I, I would love... Like if I was going to listen to a Russo Brothers commentary for Endgame or something, I want them to have the ability to pause the movie because that's where I feel like, like it's tough Ooh, when people right, yeah when you're doing commentary because you, you have to move to the next scene and you never get to come finish your thought. Uh, mm. But on the streaming service, that's what I'd love to see. Oh, interesting! Yeah. Yeah, Make yeah, a yeah. two-hour movie last four hours. I don't care if it's four hours of good commentary. All right, yeah, Russo Brothers, that. if you're listening, I totally will. <laughs> uh, do a commentary with you guys. That I'll wear available. I'll wear my Captain America costume the whole time we're talking about Winter Soldier. Let's do it. <laughs> uh, I think that's as good a place as any to wrap it up. Uh, what's yep. on the site this week, Norm? We have the second half of an amazing build that uh, people saw the first part of over the weekend, in which Adam you built a vise. Uh, yes, vise. It was out of a piece of cast iron, and where that vise ends up going was a long and a build a long process i think almost several weeks of your time Dude, it was uh, the build that never ended until it ended but i'm still so ecstatic about it it's one of those things i think you were extremely chuffed and pleased by the end of it uh so i can't wait to share that with everyone and uh Very look forward cool. to that um and will we'll have links to your tech pod yeah tech pod this week well. is um about like mental health uh, stuff that helps with mental health and coping strategies and stuff like that uh, you know, the normal exercise meditation routine, you know, it's, it's, it's good stuff. It's it, it's at uh, techpod.content.town. Awesome. Good to see all you right. both. Good to see Stay you guys. And I'll guys. see you next week. Hopefully see you all next week. Fully working eyeballs. Good luck. Right. Take all care right. of your eyes. Bye, Bye guys. Bye.